Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this is the fifth session of uh, my term 2021 of the JDG. Um, we are very pleased to welcome Kat uh, Stevens, who is assistant professor um, of, in the philosophy department, if that's right, of University of Lesbridge. And she will talk today about humility as a necessary virtue um, for the common law decision-making process. Thank you very much, Kat. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, can everybody see? Uh, ah, this is always the same thing. When I share the screen, I can't click on the slideshow button. Ah, there it is. OK. Yes, my graphics card is out of date. I'm also informed of that every time. OK, um, so today I want to talk to you about the role of humility and reasoning by precedent. I originally wrote this paper um, for a workshop that um, Alia and Maya organized uh, on um, reasoning in the law and, and virtue. And it's kind of my first venture into the area of virtue jurisprudence. I had written a little bit about virtue and argumentation before and argumentation theory, and I've written about precedent before, but this is the first time that I'm trying to write about virtue and precedent, so bringing this together. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm more nervous than I usually am about this paper. And I'm more in, in, unsure about the arguments in it that I usually am. But basically what I'm trying to do is um, kind of give, a, give kind of two connected arguments. First, I wanna argue that judicial humility should get a place on the central judicial virtue lists. So there are these lists and usually humility isn't on them, even though um, it's generally recognized that it's an important virtue for judges to have. And I want it to be on there, at least, for, or I'm making an argument, at least for common law jurisdictions, though by that I don't mean that there couldn't be an argument or that it shouldn't be in the central virtues list for civil law jurisdictions, or that the argument I, I present is the only argument you could give for it to be on the central virtues list. This is just one, and it's supposed to show that at least for common law jurisdictions, this, is, this should be a central virtue. Why? Because I think that humility is necessary uh, for fully justified common law decisions. And I mean by that both counterfactually and causally. So judges both have to make um, the kinds of decisions that hu uh, humble judges would have made. And in some way, I want to argue, humility also has to be causally connected to those decisions. Um, by the way, by fully justified, I have kind of, I just mean not only justified from the point of view of the law, but also from the point of view of political morality. And this means that for this paper, I kind of assume that having a common law in the first place and having the principle of stare decisis can be justified. So I just assume that is justified and then I look at the justifications, just kind of assuming that they're good enough. I also have to say that this paper is written kind of from a broadly positivist point of view. So it assumes things like judges have discretion um, and the law doesn't always give a clear answer, at least not one that judges are kind of legally constrained to follow. Um, so that this is just because, um, as Amalia herself has pointed out to me, my account would need a little bit of considerable work to fit with the things like Dworkin's account. So I'm just kind of limiting this and saying, well, this is a kind of um, virtue approach for broadly construed positivist thinkers. So here's how this talk is going to go. First, I'm going to um, set up basic premises. I'm going to talk about what kind of conception of humility I'm using. It's a kind of conception of humility that I'm taking from other people who've written about virtue jurisprudence. And it, it's important to kind of keep in mind that this is a little different than things that sometimes intuitively are connected with virtue, though I think that there are certain uses of humility in our everyday talk that fit with the, the kind of humility I'm talking about here. And you'll see why in a second. Um, and then I'm going to kind of talk about um, the fact that common law judges have a lot of de facto power over the content of the law and legal subjects before them. I'm not entirely sure whether I have to convince you of this, but for, for kind of to have this whole thing complete, I included arguments for this. Then I'm going to try to show that humility is necessary um, and I'm going to do this by first arguing that rule of law values and, and values of fundamental justice both play 
central roles in justifying the adoption of stare decisis, um, as in having a common law in the first place and the associated de facto power, uh, power of judges. And from there, I'm going to try to argue that community is necessary for realizing an appropriate balance of these values in common law decisions, and therefore for preserving the justification of stare decisis, and therefore for fully, as in also from the point of view of political morality, justifying these decisions. And then I'm going to try and argue that this is the case both counterfactually, namely for the individual judge and causally, the community of judges has to be humble and that has to be causally connected to the decision for this full justification. And then I'm going to try and answer two questions that I think are important about what idea I have of the humble community of judges and how they are, how they are valuable. So let's start. First, what conception of humility I'm, am I using? Um, there is kind of a large discussion about humility and there is not a lot of um, agreement on what humility is. And I am suspecting this is because there's probably several different concepts of humility and they're probably valuable all in their own right. Um, but there's on the one hand, uh, uh, some scholars who uh, think that humility is a kind of virtue of self underestimation. So you think of yourself as lesser than you actually are. You're humble if you think that you're less intelligent than you are, for example. And then there are people who say, no, humility is uh, a virtue of correct self-estimation. You, you, uh, you correctly identify how smart you are. You're neither arrogant nor, nor prone to self-abasement. Um, and this is the virtue of humility. And then there's also a kind of division um, between two concepts of humility that I think are both valuable um, and both valuable for judges, but I'm only interested in one of them. So there's on the one hand, you can think about humility as being concerned with your own personal attributes. That's for example, if you estimate your own intelligence and then you can think of humility and this is maybe the slightly less often, we might be slightly used as slightly less often in everyday thought about humility. You can think about humility as a way that you're concerned with your role or your place in relationships with others and your responsibilities to them. And I think there is a way in which we think of humility in this way in everyday talk. This is the kind of humility that we refer to when we say that someone knows their place, right? This, the, the humble servant knows their place. This is not, the servant isn't thinking about whether they're especially good at playing chess. That's not part of it. Um, what's part of it is that the humble servant knows what her role is and how, how, what, how she should use her abilities in that role. And that's the kind of humility that I'm interested in. So I'm interested in humility as a correct self-estimation applied to your place in a structure of relationships, the role that you play. And it's kind of important um, to keep this in mind because if we think about humility in one of the other senses, then my argument falls apart, basically. So the humble judge appropriately conceptualizes her role and her relationship to other legal subjects as one of service. Um, she's aware of her power and motivated by the associated responsibility to use it correctly. So I'll argue right now that um, common law judges have a lot of power and humility enables them to kind of know how that power should be used because they correctly conceptualize them as servants of their community um, and therefore will not arrogantly abuse their power, for example. So let's talk about the power that judges have. Um, it's a common place that might be worth repeating that the common law is judge-made law. By that I don't mean that it's law that is made by individual judges, but that it's law that is made by the judicial community. Um, the mechanism of precedent creates an environment in which every common law decision contributes to the law a little bit, at least, but no common law decision creates fully formed finished units of law by itself. Um, and here I should remark that I am convinced by Lamont's argument that even following in cases that aren't difficult kind of creates a teeny tiny bit of law because all case cases are a little bit different. And so it adds to the law that these differences aren't relevant, basically. So there's always like a tiny bit of law created in every decision in, in a way. Um, and almost every common law decision allows for a little bit of discretion at, at least, however minute it is, 
first almost none allows for free for all discretion. So there's almost never a case where a judge can just do whatever they please. It's always to some extent constrained, and then there's a little bit of wiggle room basically. Okay, so right, and all of this is because reasoning by precedent gives certain abilities to the later judge, right? This, this kind of discretion comes about because the later judge is the one who interprets the, the opinion of the precedent decision, who can distinguish the precedent decision, who can extend it. So even if this, the, the, the precedent isn't binding on the case, the judge can extend it and still apply it to the case or still follow the decision in the end. And, and right, and then and all of these are kind of run of the mill things that judges do. And then there's also the possibility of overruling, though that carries a pretty high burden of proof. And because of all of these things, in most cases, there's a teeny tiny bit of discretion, a little bit of wiggle room um, where the judge could, could, could have acted differently without running up against binding law. Um, and so what this kind of results in is that um, no judge has ever got the last word because after this later judge comes another later judge who can then influence again how this, the precedent that this later judge said is going to be read. But every judge gets a word in in some way. And how impactful that word is depends on a whole lot of factors. Sometimes, right, the word makes the impact of a feather slowly sinking to the ground, namely almost none. But sometimes it makes a lot of impact. And this has kind of two, two really unsurprising corollaries. Uh, first, the common law could develop to reflect the moral and political opinions of the community of judges. Judges can use their common law decision-making to influence the moral and political content of the common law um, in a way that might not jive with the way that the community at large might want their law to go. And this is partially because, right, let, while we think that part of why having a common law is democratically acceptable is because the legislature has the ability to change common law rules, we can't assume that they actually have time or resources to consider all of them. So this is not right something that tacitly is created by democratically elected legislatures, it's rather it's created by common law judges and legislatures have the ability to kind of have some control over it. And, um, and because of, right, so, and this kind of results in the fact that judges, individual judges have some kind of temptation to use whatever little bit of discretion they have to try and nudge the law in the better direction, what they think the better direction is. And because of the, and the second co corollary is that because of the complex ways in which judges can have discretion in common law cases, because there's so many different ways and it's so hard to recognize when right, a judge has just stepped over, a over the boundaries a little bit, Legal judges, uh, subjects can't completely foresee whether their case will be one in which discretion plays a larger or smaller role. And they cannot reliably determine whether the use of discretion was or was not warranted. So sometimes it's very obvious, but what I'm trying to say is from the point of view of legal subjects, right, it's not completely clear. The case that they, they can't be 100% sure that the case that they think is an easy case, it's not going to turn out to be a hard case in the judge's hands. And here I, I will, by, by the way, talk about appeals nature, so I haven't forgotten about those. Um, but what this means is that the individual judge has lots of de facto power. They have power to try and nudge the law, and they have de facto power over the legal subjects, because the legal subjects can't be entirely sure that they know how the, where the boundaries around the judge are. So now um, that I've kind of established that there's all this de facto power, I want to talk about um, what justifies um, the adoption of stereotypes. And I want to talk about this because what I'm going to do after that is going to, I'm going to say that if, if this, all this de facto power comes from stereotypes and the humble judge knows, right, interprets her role as one of serve, being a servant to the community, um, then the humble judge will want to integrate, right, will want to uphold what justifies star decisis in their decisions. So the way that they use their power will have to move, will want, they will want the, the way that they use the power to work together with what justifies them having this power in the first place. So in order to figure out what this means, we have to know why it's okay to give them this kind of power. And I think that um, a, a very important part of this justification 
are just rule of law considerations, right? People should be ruled by the law, not by other people. They should not be subject to the will of powerful individuals. They should be able to form reliable expectations about how the state will react to their actions. And they shouldn't have to form those reliable expectations by kind of making personal psychological predictions about the judge who is powerful with respect to them. Um, the rule of law protects both autonomy and dignity, or dignity slash equality. Um, so, right, autonomy and the value of uh, predictability. So, so the law, making the law predictable helps people help protect autonomy, right? It allows legal subjects to plan their lives without having to be afraid that they will get thwarted at any turn by unpredictable authorities. And the value and 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 um, making sure that judges can't have personal personal direct power over any subject. So ensuring that there is equality between them protects dignity. Right? Legal subjects are protected from becoming subject to individualized direct powers from other individuals rather than you know the state or the law. And that which which if they would become subject to this which would undermine both their equality and thereby humiliate them and right, kind of step over the boundaries of their dignity. So rule of, um, rule of law values play a central role in the justification of adopting the principle of stare decisis. And this is because stare decisis is justified by referring to its ability to further predictability because it reduces the numbers of cases in which judges must use discretion in a surprising way. So basically, while, while no setting of a precedent reduces um, discretion to zero, the kind of the boundaries in which judges can use discretions become smaller and it becomes hopefully more predictable which way decisions will go, right? And the need for predictability then kind of justifies the adoption of stare decisis. If stare decisis helps with this and we need predictability, then this justifies having it. Stare decisis is also necessary for the preservation of equality and the avoidance of humiliation, humiliating use of power given that judges have discretion. Um, because stare decisis means that right, judges need to reason in order to protect the dignity of subjects. Judges need to reason as members of the court, not as individuals, because by doing that, they avoid having individualized power over subjects. Instead, they, they only enact the power of the court. And that requires utilizing all the guidance that the law can give, making this apparent so the subject can know that this is what is happening, and acknowledging, right, and also acknowledging that earlier judges were following the law in their precedent decisions. So on the one hand, where you have discretion, you have to use as much of the law as you can. And second, you have to acknowledge that earlier judges were acting in the name of the court, the same court in whose name you're acting now. And so you have to treat their decisions as already part of the, of the opinion of the court and therefore as part of the law. And this requires you to follow precedent. And so in order to treat, not to humiliate legal subjects, you have to follow stare decisis if that makes sense. This is an argument um, from Waldron that I like especially. And this means that you have two requirements, right? Dignity requires two things of judges, namely first that judges reason from a legal point of view, from the point of view of the court and not from the point of view of them as individuals, and that judges make this apparent uh, to the legal subject. So the legal subject can know that it was the court that decided and not the judge. Because if the legal subject can't know this, so if the judge uh, um, reasons according to the law, but this is obscure to the legal subject, they're still humiliated because they still have to, are in this position where they can't know where the power comes from that reigns over them. And they can't know whether or not offending the judge, for example, will have any impact on their, um, on their case. So this needs to be made clear to the legal subject. By the way, um, I talk a lot about reasonable legal subjects from now on. By that, I just mean people that are as reasonable as the average person in this jurisdiction, not people that are reasonable in the sense of having the reason of Plato's heavens. So, um, so don't, don't worry about that possibility too much. So I think that these rule of law values are extremely central to justifying the adoption of stare decisis. 
Um, and I think they're so central that if the common law fails to re realize them, then it cannot be justified. And with that, all of the all of the common law decisions lose their full uh, justification, as in their justification also from the point of view of political morality. And this is because um, the common law faces a democratic challenge, right? It faces the challenge: why should judges be get to make law if they're not elected? And you need a justification for that. And the, so the justification, right? of having a system of binding precedent that creates law and therefore giving judges the common law associated de facto power then influences how judges should use that power. It influences what a good reason, what good reasoning also from the point of view of political morality would look like um, for a judge. And that means that rule of law values play a role in what counts as a fully justified common law decisions, right? If you want common law decisions that are fully justified also from the point of view of political morality, then they need to reflect these values or the reasoning towards them needs to reflect these values. Right? The need to make law predictable and to allow reasonable legal subjects to see that the cases have been decided by the law and not by the personal will of the judge requires that judges give appropriate weight to the reasonable expectations of legal subjects even when legitimately using discretion. And this is because if they don't take these into account and give them the appropriate weight, right? They don't try to make the law predictable and they don't try to make it such that the subjects can see that their decisions were influenced by the law and not by the idiosyncrasies of the judge. Um, so, right? you shouldn't act surprisingly, or better, the kind of the general rule that comes out of this is you avoid surprises. That's the idea. But things are obviously not this simple, right? Just because a common law decision realizes these rule of law values doesn't mean it's fully justified from the point of view of political morality. And this is because, right, rule of realizing rule of law doesn't necessarily justify it law as it is made and rule of law values can become come into conflict with and then need to be balanced against other values that are important in the law including the common law most importantly values of substantial justice right in fact if you want to fully justify right so now we say we have started decisis and it's justified by realizing rule of law values but you could realize rule of law values in other ways you could make the law completely predictable by having kind of gap filling rules. For example, the rule that anytime there is discretion decide in in the in favor of the younger person, right? You can fill gaps automatically, and the reason why you would then opt for star decisis and giving judges all this power is probably that you don't want to have to get to make unjust decisions all the time. So substantial justice actually has to kind of work together with the rule of law values to fully justify why it's our decisis that we go with instead of, for example, gap for rules. So right by the same kind of thought process as before, in order to make fully justified common law decisions, justices need to assign appropriate weights to what they believe to be reasons of substantial justice and reasons of reasonable expectations. And here it's important to note that, um, right, what a judge thinks is the is substantial justice has to be at, at the very end, kind of what their own opinion based on the best arguments that they could, could come up with is, right? You can't get, you can't recognize substantial justice through an authoritative source. You can take the arguments of that authoritative source into account, but in the end, that's the only way that you access substantial justice or what that requires is through your own reasoning. So what you need to weigh is your own reasoning about what's just and what you perceive to be the, the expectations of the subjects before you and the subjects in, in general. And the appropriate weighing of these two is then what's necessary to just fully justify also from the point of view of political morality, a common law decisions. <coughs> Sorry. So what does all of this have to do with humility? Basically, what I just did is, right, I talked a little about humility and then I talked a little bit about precedent and where's the connection. So just to recall, right, my conception or the conception of humility that I'm using says is a kind of knowing your place type of humility, 
the humble judge appropriately conceptualizes her role and her relationship to other legal subjects as one of service, and she's aware of her power and motivated by the associated responsibility to use it correctly. So authoritative rules about the ways in which common law judges need to reason with precedent do not and cannot give determinate guidance on how to weigh these two values. So the rule of law values and substantial justice value. Because if you had a set of rules that determinatively did this, then that would remove this the kind of necessary discretion in interpretation, distinguishing and extending that moves the law, common law forward. A any of these rules would remove that and thereby would kind of run into problems with exactly the kind of substantial justice value that is supposed to be partially furthered. Unless, I mean, I am assuming here that, right, the rule would have to be made by humans and not by a God who could foresee all cases that are coming up and what substantial justice would demand. So the only thing that can provide such guidance, so if there can't be a set of rules, then the only thing that can provide this kind of guidance on how to balance this is an appropriate understanding of the judicial role, right? You need to have an appropriate idea of what it is that you're supposed to do and what kind of relationship you stand in with the legal subjects and how important it is for you to fulfill the expectations and so on in order to appropriately weigh these two values against each other. That understanding provides the basis on which judges can determine the appropriate weight of these types of reasons on a case-to-case -case basis. And that understanding is, has here the name humility, right? This understanding is kind of product, the product of judicial humility by the, 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 the type of concept of humility that I picked out of the discussion of humility. Though, of course, right, humility is more than just the understanding. It also requires that you motivate it by that understanding. So, right, the de facto powers that judges possess tempt her, tempt them to arrogance, expressed by kind of overvaluing the weight that their own perception of substantial justice gets. So that you have so much power in your hands tempts you to use it in order to enact substantial justice as you understand it. But if you overcorrect here, then you would end up in what we could call self-abasement, um, which would mean that you undervalue the weight that your perceptions of substantial justice should have. And then you shirk the responsibility that you share with other judges um, to kind of direct the content of the common law in the right direction. And in addition to that, right, if you follow the reasonable expectations of legal subjects in cases where they expect extremely unjust things, then it can be more humiliating to, to follow those expectations than to kind of allow them to feel like they are at the discretion of the judge sometimes. So humility as the correct understanding of the judicial role and judicial responsibility is then the basis for correct weighing, right? It's the thing that keeps you from arrogance and self-abasement. And that is why it's necessary because you can't replace this, this correct understanding of your role with a set of rules. But now, right, and now I come to the last two bits. Um, what kind of necessity are we talking about? So Amaya makes a distinction between a counterfactual version of saying that virtue is necessary for good decision making and a causal version of saying that. The counterfactual version says that a legal decision is justified if and only if it is a decision that a virtuous legal decision maker would have taken in like circumstances. And the causal version would say a legal decision is justified if and only if it has, has been taken by a virtuous legal decision maker. So the virtue has to be a causal factor in the decision. And Amaya um, goes with the counterfactual version. She argues that, right, if someone commits a murder, then convicting them of murder is the justified decision. This is so whether or not the justification for the decision was, mo was, was motivated by, vir by virtue, right? Whether or not the reason why you should make the decision is the motivation for the decision. If you make the decision you should, then it's justified. Convicting those who are actually guilty of murder is what the virtuous judge would do. And this is a necessary part of making, of being a justified decision, right? Um, but if the vicious judge convicts the murderer of murder, then that is still the right decision. It's the justified decision to make. So this is also true when it comes to specifically humility and specifically precedent. 
it looks like it should be true, right? Imagine this vicious judge and her decision making. So our judge is motivated solely by advancing her career and thereby, and therefore, because this is a way to advance her career, the opinion of her peers. But she happens to work in a ju jurisdiction that is saturated with humility. There's just humility everywhere around her. It's just her who's, who's just interested in her career. And so she reliably makes decisions that a virtuous humble judge would make because she wants her peers to think highly of her. They are all humble, so they will all approve of decisions that a humble judge would have made. And she is smart enough to figure out what that decision would be just by kind of thinking about what they would like. And then she makes those decisions just to further her career. The result would be that you would get predictable decisions with opinions that give reasonable subjects good reasons to believe that they were ruled by the law and not by the judge. Now, in fact, they weren't, right? The, the legal subjects are wrong, but this would be the result, right? Now, you could say, okay, but the rule of law requires more than that legal subjects think this. It does require that legal subjects think this, but it also requires that legal subjects are actually not made subject to individual power from individual judges. This is also an important part to the justification of stare decisis. And aren't subjects who stand before this vicious judge really subject to her personal power, right? After all, if the vicious judge finds out that, after, that, they, that her colleagues are not humble after all, or they are humble, but they have this flaw in their epistemic capacities, and so they make the wrong decision for that reason, then she wouldn't hesitate to make other decisions, right? The, her decision-making isn't connected appropriately to the rule of law values and the value of substantial justice. It's, it's just kind of indirectly connected it because all the people she wants to impress are interested in this. Now, what follows from that? I don't think what from, follows from this is that you need a causal connection between virtue, the virtue of humility and the decision for every individual judge and every single decision. For this, I think still counterfactual humility is necessary and enough. But I think that you do need at least some kind of moderate amount of humility so in your judicial community. Your judicial community has to be threshold humble, and this needs to be causally connected to the decisions that are supposed to be fully justified. Now, what do I mean by that? So um, if you think back at my story about our vicious judge, in that story, the humility in the community was causally connected to her decisions because she makes those decisions just because the humble judges would like them, right? And so the humility in the community can become a causal factor in counterfactually humble decisions of even vicious judges in this way, right? Because there are soft constraints on judges, the way that judges are taught in law schools, how their careers progress, what will earn them advancements and perks of all kinds. Even how they think about fundamental justice is influenced by what other judges and members of the legal community think. And therefore, the, right, even for a vicious judge and their decision making, if they come into power in a humble community, then this is likely because they make the kinds of decisions that a humble community will uh, reward by furthering them in their career or even giving them good marks in, in law school, right? Um, and right, so in a way, the humble community causally connects to the counterfactually correct decisions of the vicious judge. And this is necessary because this is what holds the vicious judge in place, so to say, what makes it reliable that they will make these counterfactually good decisions, counterfactually virtuous decisions. And in addition, you also need, right, now it is the case that vicious judges in most legal systems sometimes get the opportunity to make vicious decisions without being punished by these soft constraints. And that means that right, you also need for, in the humble community, some way for subjects to allow, to escape vicious judges and the kind of bad power structure that's there and move to situations where they will be judged according to the law and by virtuous judges, right? Here it's important to say that right community humility is is then necessary, causally necessary for good decisions, but it's not sufficient, right? Because 
in order for either of these two factors to create the causal relationship between humility and decisions that is needed for full justification, the legal system also has to be structured adequately. For example, it can't be that you have an appeal system in place, but only rich individuals can afford to appeal. Um, but that's another story and we can talk about it at another time. And I think that, right, you could say that you have such huge rule of law problems in communities like that, that you won't get a justified common law anyways. So without community humility, legal subjects are subject to the personal power of judges, not the law, right? Unless the kind of causal connections between the humility of the community and the decisions that vicious judges in that community make, without that causal connection, the vicious judge is not appropriately held in place um, and therefore it's not reliable that they will make the counterfactually good decisions and therefore legal subjects now are subject to their personal power right and that undermines their dignity and so the common law then fails to realize one of the values that justify it it also undermines equality and common law decisions made in this context then undermine the justification of the common law and thereby their own justification from the point of view of political morality. I should, I should make sure that I always add that. Um, so community humility is then causally necessary for the full justification of common law decisions. So now, very last, I'm probably, I'm already over time. No. Um, so now one, two very small questions that I think I should answer. First of all, I should um, explain what it means for a community of judges to be humble. What exactly do I mean by that? And then I should also answer the question whether, right, whether a virtuous humble judge could make fully justified decisions in a vicious community. So when I say it's causally necessary with respect to the community, do I mean either there has to be a causal connection between the individual judge's humility to the decision, or the community can step in, or does the unit, or is the humility of the community always necessary? So, to the first, now I can't move my slide. So, first, the first question. There are two different views of what um, a virtue for a community can mean. Either you can say what I mean when I say a community is virtuous is I mean that as kind of threshold amount or percentage of the individuals in that community have that virtue and then it's virtuous or I can mean a collectivist view and say there's more right first of all there has to be this threshold reached but second there's more necessary there has to be something about that community in addition to just the individual members being virtuous that gives it the community virtue and I'm going with the collectivist view here which you probably guessed because I require all these causal connections and they need to be established in a way that might not always follow directly from the judges being humble, right? A judicial community can only be humble in the relevant sense for me here if it's organized in a way that causally connects the humility of its humble judges with the decisions of its vicious judges. Um, so you need these kinds of systems of advancement that make sure that um, judges that make like vicious decisions that are not even counterfactually virtuous won't advance very high and so on. In addition, it also must be organized so that legal subjects can move from the influence of vicious judges to that of humble judges, which is a kind of, it's, which is an organizational point that has little to do with whether or not individual, a threshold amount of individual judges is humble. So this, I have a collectivist view of group virtue here. The second question is whether virtuous humble judges can make fully justified decisions even in a vicious community. So how necessary exactly is a humble community? I think it is just necessary. I think that being humble as an individual judge is not enough to replace a humble community. But about this one, I'm really not that sure. I have three reasons and I'm really not that sure how weighty they are. I'm just gonna present them and you'll make up your own mind. You'll do that anyways, because you're philosophers. So first, I think that a vicious community of judges is likely to create a common law that does not appropriately reflect substantial justice. Unless you have judges that are just, they only vice is arrogance, but they have a completely correct view of judge, justice, which could happen, I guess, in some world somewhere. But in general, I think it's likely that a vicious community is gonna create a common law that doesn't appropriately reflect substantial justice. So even virtuous judges, humble judges would have to rely on this fundamentally unjustified common law. Second, I think in a vicious community, legal subjects will have reason to suspect 
that they are subjects to the personal power of every judge they encounter because they have reason to suspect that those judges are vicious and will use their discretion inappropriately. They cannot know that they have just come across one of the few virtuous ones. And as I think Waldron correctly points out, it's important for the preservation of dignity that legal subjects can know that they are judged by the law and that they are not subject to personal power so that they don't have to kind of worry about not offending the judge by wearing a red tie or something. Third, I think that the virtuous judicial community adds an element of non-arbitrariness to the connection between the justifying values um, that the values justifying having stare decisis and the legal decision. So the fact that the judicial community is virtuous makes it such that there is a causal, a reliable causal connection between the virtues of substantial justice and rule of law and the decisions that are being made when discretion is used. Um, and it ensures that this connection exists even for vicious judges. In vicious communities, the legal subject is subject to arbitrary power even when it happens to encounter a virtuous judge because she is now kind of at the mercy of the ch of chance namely that the, that there's virtue in the judge and if the judge suddenly happened to you know has a bad day and isn't virtuous today or if it if she lost her virtue or if the subject ended up in front of a different judge by chance then things would change for her and so the subject even in front of the virtuous judge is subject to kind of the individual virtue of powerful people. So subject to powerful people instead of the law again. Um, while right, a, a humble community holds judici um, judicial decisions in place to be connected to this, especially if there's a good appeal system. And, and that's it. Thank you very much.